Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. We... Hello, everyone. Um, I think we're just going to give it a couple more minutes while people are coming in and then get started. Hello, Urban. And the fine witch button. Means like we've got about seven people viewing at this point. So that's good. I'm guessing three three of those is us, of course. Um, but uh, count, it counts us. It does count us, actually. So the rest of it, there are still four people who have joined us. So thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes uh, before we get started. So the structure of this conversation is really, well, it's going to be conversational. The idea of it is if you if you would like to share it, your screen or if you would like to join us by video, I think that'll be fantastic. If you have questions, then please feel free to type that into the chat box under sessions. And we will try and address uh, your questions um, as the session progresses. This is meant to be as conversational as, as possible. So we are not, this is not going to be a presentation. We're going to be having a conversation about data sovereignty and how that how you can deal with it when you are scaling across regions, scaling up your solution, scaling up your business, um, talking about compliances and how that could impact or how you can plan for some of those. Um, so yeah, it's going to be an exciting one. Um, feel free to please um, send in your questions or uh, just join us by video. We are, we are a fairly friendly bunch, so uh, don't worry about it. Cool. I think just one more minute and we will begin. I'm guessing the folks that have dialed in are uh, local, as in it closer could, to this time zone, or they could be anywhere in the world. Be, right? Yeah. So, oh, well. Because I, I, I dialed in on a few sessions for uh, when it was happening live in the US. So, yeah, I think so. Can be enough. But, uh, well, good yeah. morning or good evening to wherever you are in the world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's get started. I think I think that might be a good good way to actually get started in terms of just understanding where everybody is from. So if you could maybe type in where you're from, um, which region, which country, whether you're locally here in Singapore, whether you are in the greater APAC region, or just here globally from a worldwide uh, as a worldwide audience, uh, perhaps just type that in so that we get a bit of an understanding of the audience as well and and, and where you're coming from. Um, I'm going to get the ball rolling by saying Singapore. Um, pretty much the three of us are here from Singapore. Um, and so I think I'm just going to get started with this conversation. And um, so hello and welcome, everyone. This is a roundtable discussion about dealing with data sovereignty as we scale up as an organization. Um, the format of this this roundtable is really meant to be conversational. In so, if you if you're comfortable, feel free to join us um, as as uh, join us with video um, or audio, whichever you're comfortable with. Um, otherwise, you feel free to send us your questions on the chat box. Um, hello, Bian from Singapore. Um, hello. <laughs> So this is really cool. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to start off with just setting the scene a little bit in terms of what kind of discussion we are really going after and what, what topics we are trying to cover here. Because data sovereignty, again, could have a lot of different implications across different regions, across different uh, verticals even. Um, so me, I am 
going to introduce myself. I'm Buddha. I am a product evangelist at Dyke. Dyke is a, is a open source API management platform um, with an open source API gateway available, along with our analytics and dashboard, which enables you to get a best of breed uh, API management solution for your organization. Um, so with me, joining me today is Jonathan. And Jonathan, maybe a quick introduction for you. Hello, everyone. Uh, Jonathan here, a consulting engineer for Tyke. Um, hoping I can answer some of the questions here from a technical perspective. Great. Uh, and also joining us from Singapore is Arvin. Uh, Arvin, introduction. Hello. Good, good morning, everyone. So Arvin here. Uh, I represent the commercial department of Tyke. Um, anything you want to ask about licensing, different type of license model, deployment model, feel free to, to ask those questions. Thank you. Okay, so diving right into the discussion, I think there are a couple of, couple of issues that we are sort of trying to tackle. Um, so typically, when an organization starts, you start off small, you're trying to be agile, you're trying to solve potentially, hopefully, a problem that you've encountered and you've figured out a solution that you're going to be tackling. And typically, that tends to happen either on a regional scale, local scale, uh, small scale, and then you start to build up. And hopefully, you've been successful, and now you're trying to move uh, based on where your customers are, are located to really look at a solution that can actually service all of your clients in a better way. And that's usually when you're trying to look at scale and scaling across multiple regions. Um, once you start doing that, there could be a couple of different challenges that might come in where you're talk looking at, then you have to start considering um, how or who is really controlling your data or where is your data really sitting? Where is it being hosted from? Where is it actually, and more importantly, transiting across? So this is typically one of the key, key things to consider when you're really, really looking at the ultimate question we are really trying to focus on today is uh, the question of control. Who controls your data? Who owns your data? Um, infrastructurally, we tip, these days we are, we are kind of looking at cloud hosting platforms for API management, API hosting, and there are different, different solutions out there with different regions available. So another question that might typically come up is, Right. So what do we do when there isn't a region that is covered in, in, um, by, by one of these solutions out there? And how do you actually manage that? The other ones then come are more vertical specific, um, where certain verticals specifically around, say, healthcare or financial services may have very specific requirements around compliance and how you tackle data, whether you need to anonymized data? How do you handle your personally identifiable information? These are all the different considerations that you need to make when you're thinking about a solution and in specifically around an API management solution as well. Um, some of it, to, to think about it, some of these things are not necessarily just the responsibility of an API gateway per se, but usually are part of an overall architecture that you consider. Where, which it would include your or hosting services, which would include your databases, which would include how your DNS is essentially mapping different requests coming from different regions. So these would be the typical ideologies to go after or to consider when you're thinking about something like data sovereignty. So with that, as a little bit of a basis, hopefully I've given you a bit of an introduction in terms of the, the basic challenges across verticals, across regions, um, I'm, I'm going to try and think of things, start off with things which are a bit more APAC focused, but also since we are talking about regionally or interregionally scaling up, there might be challenges that would be, say, coming out from if you're moving to Europe, for instance, then questions around GDPR comes in and how would you then make data readily available for people who want to get more control over their personally accessible data. Um, if you are moving across different regions within Singapore, then how do you tackle different regional requirements when it comes to data? Or in some cases, it might just come down to maybe my solution actually doesn't need any of this. So being really, I think, key step here would be to really talk, think about what is it that I really need for my solution? What kind of data is actually going to be necessary for my solution to function? 
and for us to create an experience that our customers are actually going to benefit from. Often what happens and when the challenges start is we don't really know what we want. We don't really know what might be useful. And therefore, we're going to be storing everything. We're going to be saving everything. And all of the information is going to be sitting in our infrastructure. And that's typically that could happen when you're starting off because there is a bit of an experimental experimentation, trial and error kind of a situation that, that starts off. But as you grow and evolve, I think a bit more of a focused uh, thinking around what is it that I really need to service and create an experience that that would service the clients better. I think that is going to be a better approach to, to look at it. That way, you can you, you don't get into a trap of, okay, we are, we are having all of this data and now we have to actually process it, even though these are really not bringing us enough value. And then we have to get into the whole idea of refactoring databases and um, and and almost trying to trying to solve a problem which shouldn't have been there, which is not bringing any value to to your businesses. So yeah, so I think I think that's that's sort of kind of my initial talk around this. And if you have any questions, once again, feel free to ask those questions um, on our chat or just join us. Uh, I see about we've got about nine people who are here. So hello and welcome once again. Uh, we are talking about how to deal with data sovereignty when we scale up as a business. So our perspective is a little bit more from an API management um, solution, of course, which is what we do at Tyke. And um, so maybe, uh, Irvin, if I can get your quick input around this, because you, you, you deal with a lot of commercial clients, you deal with a lot of different uh, people who might be looking at cross interregional sort of solutions or even specific to Singapore where um, there may be specific verticals, right? Like government, for instance. So, what are the key questions that come up when you when you have these initial conversations, architectural conversations, or commercial conversations around it? Uh, Irvin, I think I think your your microphone isn't it's muted. I think. Sorry. So, so a lot of clients, um, whether it's from commercially or or from the public sector. Um, they, 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 they wanted a solution that has a, a multi-regional deployment model, right? So meaning whether it's a multi-deployment or multi-regional, um, multi-cloud provider uh, deployment. So for example, in the government, they have a, a few cloud providers and, and they, they would like a single control plane to be able to, to, to manage all these um, distributed deployment, right? as well as uh, multinational uh, corporations where they have a regional deployment like across continents, uh, Europe, uh, US, Asia. And, and, and Thai has this unique solution from, from, from the beginning where uh, you can just deploy a, a, a control and, and manage all the gateways, all your APIs, um, across regions, across country, across continents. And that, that makes you know, the life of the so-called administrator, the one who is managing all these APIs. You, you can even uh, allocate or, or, or designate the, the individual region uh, man administrator right, to manage uh, each individual region or, or country right, or, or even cloud provider. Right? You, you can also deploy a, a, a hybrid model uh, from on-premise to all the way to cloud, private cloud, public cloud. Um, we have customers who deploy our solution in, in the various various cloud providers like Azure, GPC, AWS, even Ali Cloud in Indonesia. So, so, so uh, lots of uh, uh, interesting deployment model because Tide has this unique um, agile containerized uh, components that allows you to, to deploy how you want to deploy it based on your your architecture or your security architecture design or requirements, right? So yeah, so those are some of the sharing I have uh, working with clients around around APEC. Yeah. Thank you. So, so one of the things I could add, actually, Urban touched on something uh, pretty integral here, is that Tyke is platform agnostic. So. As he mentioned, um, a lot of our customers um, deploy either the entire infrastructure on AWS or Azure, or, or you could even do uh, a mix of the two. So 
By platform agnostic, that means you can deploy across different platforms at the same time. So if you want to host some components in AWS and other components in Azure, you can, as long as these different components are, are different systems that are able to talk to each other, then that should work perfectly fine. Um, and actually the hardware, as Urban mentioned, you can deploy on, could be physical or virtual. So um, we tend to work a lot with Docker um, or Docker-based containers, um, or you could also just put it on an on-prem solution and use a rack and a physical server. So as far as data sovereignty, I, I think um, it obviously depends with lo which geographic location you're in, which country, which region, but um, we have different options to uh, conform to the local laws. So if you need to have uh, it on-prem, solely on-prem on an isolated instance, uh, that should work perfectly fine. Or if you're able to um, deploy in a hybrid solution, uh, that we can easily do that. And e each architecture could scale um, either horizontally or vertically. Um, it's meant to be quite agile, the, the, the software. Fantastic. Yeah, um, that's that's really good. I, th I think another another concern that people usually have when scaling up is also thinking about cost as well. And I feel like almost being able to to have these best of breed style solution where you're getting the flexibility of where you put your infrastructure, what kind of infrastructure that you choose, being the best based on the needs that you have, would go in a long way. Go a long way in in actually thinking about it from a cost perspective as well. Whereas yeah. not really tied down into a, a single solution, which is trying to do a whole lot of things, but coming at a lot, lot larger cost. Whereas on a more local basis, if you're focused on a problem specifically and being able to manage that across different providers, for instance, then I believe there's going to be an impact in terms of the overall cost of ownership as well. Yeah, um, that's, that's, that's true. Um... So, so many customers choose type because, like, like Jonathan said, platform diagnostic, right? It, it give them the chance of, you know, maybe in the future they want to change a cloud provider. That's not a problem for them. It's yeah. not a vendor login a tie into any any platform. Um, it, it, um, yeah. So, so it can be Azure, can be Ali, uh, and and uh, any any other cloud provider, right? So. So and, and our licensing model doesn't go by the the, the volume, so it's it's quite economical. Um, we have customer who who scale up and scale down uh, the gate our gateways based on based on the traffic they they receive. Uh, they, they yeah they receive throughout the year. Got it. Great. Um, I think Jonathan also in terms of just architecturally thinking about this, there could be requirements around. For instance, you want your say east west. Um, communications to primarily sit within an intranet zone. And maybe the north-south interactions are more an internet zone. So are there specific considerations that you would make when you are, you're architecting a solution like this, where you have these specific requirements around what can communicate with what within organizations? And this is something that you typically see with a lot of government clients as well. So what would your take be in terms of an architectural perspective? Sure, great, great question. I, I think first of all, what the team does is we uh, conform to the local laws, especially when we're working with, uh, say, a government client. Uh, they have different frameworks that they need to follow and and um, conform to. So that would be sort of number one: uh, is make sure we're within uh, the boundaries of what we can do architecturally, as far as as far as data sovereignty. Correct. Um, a lot of uh, our clients look at uh, the high availability and they deploy this uh, within uh, multiple zones or environments, as you mentioned. So an internet and then intranet, or uh, we're working with a client now that's doing, I think four separate zones and we're looking at uh, doing active passive uh, instances and also active active. Um, so it really depends on, on, on what the requirements are, but I would say from uh, a type perspective is that we will one address the requirements, but then two conform within uh, the different frameworks that that our government uh, clients have. Um, that would be probably the most important. Um, we don't want to propose anything that would cause any issues as far as data sovereignty or uh, risk to um, uh, data issues, for example. Got it. Okay. Um, just just to add on uh, on on the last question about 
cost of ownership. Uh, just to give you one live example of a customer who has been using a, 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 another API management solution for the last three years, but migrated to Thai and, and now in their second year with Thai. And, and, and they are, they are, they are, their savings from, from licenses and infrastructure after migrating to Thai is, is 100k sing dollar per year. And, and that's how significant um, the saving is. And, and we are talking about a light to light deployment in, in, in a cloud, same cloud provider environment, right? So, so nothing different. Um, the deployment environment is the same and, and infrastructure plus license costs, that's, that's a lot of saving for them. Amazing. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of that might also do with being very intentional in terms of how you're architecting a solution as well. Like, of course, there are going to be price differences in terms of the overall solutions and, and how you go about it. But if you start thinking about the intent of the data that you are actually dealing with, the transactions that you're actually handling, and the ultimate experience for the clients, I think that makes a huge difference when it comes to a starting off with picking a solution in itself, and then how you're actually making use of that solution to enable uh, you to better service those clients. That way you're thinking about your data and what really needs to be recorded. That directly correlates to the amount of volume that you're saving and therefore cost saving, as well as the number of transactions and how that is being handled within a, and across regions and how you're storing that information. So perhaps I think that's another reason why I think I've been trying to say it's a lot of it is to do with intention, like really knowing and understanding who you're servicing and what is it that you're going to be providing as a solution makes a huge difference uh, in terms of cost, in terms of experience, in terms of even data sovereignty, and almost maybe not to the extent that it's going to solve data sovereignty issues, but it will simplify the kind of problems that you need to deal with, um, as opposed to having to deal with a whole lot of different things in, in tandem with actually building out a solution that works. Um, if, if I could just add on to, to that point here, I, th I think also, um... What, what happens with our competitors is that they just try and sell you a solution that doesn't solve the problem for, for, for our clients. Uh, you, you get a lot of just people trying to sell, um, this is our architecture, this is our gateway, et cetera. Whereas with Tyke, I, I think we, we really just focus on the requirements first. Uh, we're an API first company. Um, and, and, and we really evaluate, is, is this uh, a solution? Is, this, is there a solution for this problem that our client has um, or potential client has? That we can solve and we can address, and um, if not, then you know we address that appropriately. So we're not um, here to just cram a, a single architecture for for all these different scenarios. Um, so that's I think one of the key differences with with Tyke is just the upfront um, and also just the project management of everything. Um, we we uh, really focus on uh, client interactions, client demos, uh, POCs um, to make sure everyone's on board. And that we are indeed um, solving the problem correctly and solving the right problem. Great. Um, I see a few more people have joined us. So please feel free. Hello and welcome. Feel free to type in your questions. Um, we'll be happy to answer them. Join us on video if you are comfortable doing that. Uh, we are talking about data sovereignty and how to deal with it as we scale across different regions. Um, so let's go back to a bit of the basics in terms of the requests that come in. So there are, of course, if we talk about the overall solution as, as API management, there are different components to it. Uh, API Gateway is obviously one of those, but it literally starts off from the point of, you know, where a request comes in and how that request gets handled. So for instance, if you have a multi-regional um, sort of a setup, then what kind of responsibility do these individual components almost have to tackle? I think one of them could be what the, the first point of entry, typically in, in something like this, could be a DNS. And perhaps as a, at the DNS level, what you could do is think about geographical routing of your requests. And that could simplify things as well in terms of just adding a little bit of intelligence in terms of where the request needs to be serviced. And therefore, um, how that request gets handled could be handled based on local policies, standards, and requirements. Um, typically, enough, some, sometimes it is easy to think that the gateway is essentially going to be doing a lot of these things. But I think there is there is a, there needs to be a sense of caution there as well, because ideally we want the gateway to to think of things on a more stateless basis, where it's not really aware. There is not a lot of intelligence or code that is built into it. 
Um, so, so there are things like these routing, which can be handled by the gateway as well, I would think, if you're thinking about a more of a multi data center sort of a uh, solution. But this is something that ideally, if you handle at the DNS level, it makes things a lot easier and simplifies the overall process. Um, so, so, so in, in that similar way, Jonathan, if we were to think of the overall API management as a solution, what role would some of these different components play in, in simplifying how the data is being handled and transiting and, and, and tackled? Sure. Well, great question. I think one of the examples I'll bring up here is the architecture that we have for multi-region or multi-geographical uh, instances would be the multi-data center bridge. Um, so in this architecture, we essentially have one uh, sort of control um, control data center and that could be placed wherever you want in the world. Um, and then you have separate, uh, what are known as uh, worker data centers. And, and these are also spread across the world um, or geographically, uh, lo locally, uh, it, it really depends on, on, on you or how you'd like to deploy that. So in this control plane, we have um, this, this main component, the, the master data center bridge, which controls all the worker uh, data centers. And in each, worker data center, you have um, a gateway and ideally uh, or recommended a, a local Redis. So Redis is the key value store database that we use, that the gateway uses for um, storing tokens and authentication uh, configurations. Um, and, and so each data center would then operate independently um, across the, the world basically. And you would then control all your separate data centers from this um, uh, control data center plane. Um, one of the things to think about is that um, really the gateway relies a lot on Redis for um, all of its transactions or all of the proxy requests. Um, so it's important to have a lot of RAM and a lot of um, uh, a strong um, network capability to, to handle all this. And I would say one of the benefits of this architecture is that if ever there's a, a connection severed between a worker data center and the control data center, the independent data center or the individual data center is still available to operate on its own. Um, although in that particular instance, it won't be able to generate keys for new um, configurations, but uh, it'll still uh, basically function and run. So you would have some time to uh, bring that connection back up between the control and the worker. Um, lots of things to think about, um, scalability, high availability. Um, uh, again, I don't, I don't have any specifics on, uh, perhaps any environments that our, our people here listening might have, but, uh, all it takes is a quick phone call and we could work through some of this. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's actually a lot of different scenarios and a lot of use cases that, that we fulfill with this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. I think. The, so, like we were talking about different components, so we started off with DNS. I think what Jonathan just mentioned was specifically around the the API gateway and and how the um, how the different components work together. With Tyke, our component depends on on Redis and and MongoDB for handling some of the different um, data and co components that we that we are managing on a gateway level whether that is information around um, the keys, whether that's information around the APIs and how that's being handled, whether that's information around analytics. <laughs> and so when we are talking about multi-regionally, there are a few potential solutions. The simplest, albeit not the most efficient, would be to just have, your a have different instances of your um, API gateway sitting regionally, locally, and doing its own thing. That could work for a few, few different scenarios, I would assume, as long as you do not need all of them to potentially talk back again and to re-communicate. If, if there are regional solutions that can be managed and handled regionally, that could be one of the potential solutions. Yeah. But typically what happens is what you really need is that bit of a local solution that is then combined and aggregated on a, a global or a more widespread scale which is kind of the solution what Jonathan was referring to, which is the MDCB or multi-data center bridge, which we have at Tyke, where what it does, it does have those local instances being available across regions, but is being controlled by um, a, a more centrally driven data bridge, 
which is taking care of the global analytics, the global data stores um, that is being tackled by the, the, the gateway itself. This again does not absolve you of how you handle your data itself. So this is typically just the data layer of its own. But beyond this as well, you still need to think about, okay, once, once the data is processed, once the request has been processed, how or where are you actually storing the, the information associated with these requests, whether that is still being handled by the gateway, is it being handled or stored in your own local databases, and where and how are you actually handling some of those things? Um, at Kike, one of our features, we 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 try and we try and save some of the we make it available for you to actually save some of the detailed records of um, the requests that come through. Now, in some cases, that is going to be valuable. In some cases, it may not be. So ideally, you have the ability to, to switch that off and not have that storage being handled by, by the gateway. Why is that important? Is because the way you can think of the solution, if you think of it from a more component to component basis, is you can still have gateways sitting in different regions um, where closer to your clients, closer to the requests that are going to be coming in, and at the same time have data being stored in a region which is more compliant um, to what you really need. Um, and in that case, it could be a very region specific thing. So you, you almost let the gateway do a bit of the heavy lifting when it comes to requests, when it comes to rate limiting, when it comes to managing some of your API keys, but you can potentially still have your, your data plane um, sitting in a, in a location, um, in, in a single location, which is just concerned about the compliance of that specific region. Um, so that could be a potential solution, which something like, like an MDCB could enable in a way. Um, but the, the point that I'm trying to drive home is a gateway is only going to be one part of it. When you're thinking about a solution around data sovereignty, you need to think of it from a more holistic perspective and almost task the different components of your API management platform or API management solution to, to handle the different things in its own way. What is What are the different components good at solving? The DNS is better at routing requests. So let that handle your geographical requests and, and how it's going to route those. Your API gateway is really good at, at handling things like rate limiting or providing a single way to manage your different API endpoints or creating virtual endpoints or creating security authentication protocols. Uh, so that's it, it's good at doing that. And it can do that on a multi-regional basis. Um, your databases are good at actually storing data and, and being queried for data. And therefore, it has its own role to play there. Um, so these are kind of the, a few different considerations when you need to think, when you think about uh, data sovereignty from a more global perspective. So that way, what you're doing is you're kind of simplifying it, simplifying the problem that you have um, to talk about. Hey, uh, let, <clears throat> actually, well, since we're on this topic, um, yeah. let me know if you can see my screen, uh, yeah. Buddha. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so this is the scenario uh, Buddha was just running through. This is the controller data center. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, <clears throat> here are the other data centers, data center A, data center B. So this is uh, effectively what's spread across the world. <clears throat> and as far as uh, local storage, uh, all the long-term analytics data, uh, API definitions, <clears throat> that's all stored here in MongoDB. So effectively, yes, you can um, comply to different uh, geography standards. Um, through this control data center. So this would be uh, perhaps the most compliant uh, or the, the compliant component, um, wherever that may be, whether you're in um, Asia PAC, uh, North America, Europe, um, you would comply to different standards here. Uh, and then here you have the benefit of having a local presence uh, across the world um, with your local gateway and local Redis instance that is then touching uh, those API servers locally. So, um, that's just a quick overview of, of this. Um. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Um, I'm mindful of time. I think we are we are pretty much to the end of the time at this point. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask those now. Or you can always visit us at our booth. We are exhibiting as Tyke. And I think Irvin, Jonathan, myself, we are going to be available at the booth, taking your questions and responding to anything that you may have, whether that's related to this topic or to API management, whether that is more to understand about Tyke 
or um, if you just want to have a chat. I think we are a friendly bunch of people, happy to have a conversation at any point of time. Uh, we are all just getting out of lockdown anyway. So this virtual platform for things which are a bit more, uh, we've gotten used to it a little bit more these days. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's 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 kind of the the key points that we wanted to bring out today. Um, just to recap a little bit, think about uh, when you're talking about data sovereignty, the idea is really thinking about who controls your data and how your data transits and gets stored. Um, think about what would be the most valuable information to store for better servicing your clients. And where does that information need to be stored, again, in service of those clients? If you think of that, um, I think that's going to be a fantastic starting point. It simplifies the overall information that you need to tackle. And think of your API management solution as, as, as different components that are coming together to, again, solve a particular problem. And if you task the different components to handle different aspects of the request, aspects of your solution, aspects of what needs to be stored, then it, again, overall, the idea is simplifying what compliance means across regions, across verticals. So with that, I am going to say thank you very much, everyone who's been watching us, who's been viewing us, who's been listening to us and will be listening to us because this is going to be recorded as well in the future. <laughs> uh, we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Irvin, for joining me for this session as well. Bye. See you at the booth. Right. Thanks, everyone. See you guys at the booth. Bye-bye. <laughs>